Welcome to the Swirl Suite, everybody. On this episode, we talk to guest Antonio Galoni. Antonio is an American wine critic and the founder and CEO of Venice, for which he is the lead critic covering wines of Bordeaux, California, Italy, and Champagne. Listen to this full story here. Let us know what you think. Cheers. Welcome to the Swirl Suite, everybody. It's me and Tanisha today. Hi, Tanisha. Hi, Serena. How are you? I'm good. I'm a little tired. You know, we record on Monday sometimes, so it's a, it feels like a Monday, but I'm good. How are you? Tired. Like you just had the weekend to like refresh. So. But it's Monday. So I had to like get up and like be productive. But Mondays, you're supposed to have that extra energy that, oh, I just came off mm-hmm. the weekend. I feel rested and relaxed. I'm good. Yeah, no, I wasn't feeling that today. Not today. It's like that sometimes. It's all good. It I'll bounce back. Good. All right. Tomorrow. And, <laughs> so how was your week in Paris? Any other updates? No, <laughs> no updates. <laughs> no holding someone's hand and, you know, spinning around in a circle. None of that. Okay. <laughs> Nothing amazing. Um, All right. I'm trying to think of what I did that was like extra. Not just sat out on, um, they have this thing called Paris Plage, which they make a few areas into a beach for the summer. Hmm. And yesterday was the last day for it. So I went out and sat out there for a little while and okay. went longer, but then the clouds came and it got gray and it started getting windy. And I was like, mm, I think I should go now. Uh, All right. came, so, um, Did you have any great wine? You mentioned a blind tasting that you did earlier. Yes, I did it with the, um, some red wines from Southern Rome. So they were delicious. Uh, mm. The pop and a minivoir for it so very nice and did you get I mean were you wait were you organizing the blind tasting so you knew what the wines were or were you participating I organized it and so I know ah, okay so okay. I was just kind of um not quizzing but had a friend taste them and was mm-hmm. like, oh, do you get what do you think what are the flavors and aromas that you're getting from this mm-hmm. and it was funny because she didn't get it right <laughs> she really likes Cote de Rome so that's why I was surprising that she didn't hmm. she's like oh my god I love Cote de Rome I was like see you never know what you know when you blind taste stuff you just don't know because people say they like something or they don't like something oh I don't like this wine I don't like it mm-hmm. taste them on it and then they're like oh this wine is great what is it oh I can't wait to buy a bottle haha it's Mm-hmm. Blind tasting is a, um, it's a learned behavior. I don't know why yeah. some people think you're born with this gift of, oh, I can taste anything blind and know what it is. Mm, not so much. No, it's a skill. And like yeah. I tell people, it's blind tasting is more of what it's not than what mm. it, when you taste it, it's more, okay, it tastes like this. So I know it's not this, this, and this. Yeah, absolutely. Acidity. So I know it can't be, you know, this other. yeah. Yeah, well, we have a very special guest with us today. Um, his name is Antonio, and he's a writer, a wine critic. The list goes on. He has his own network. Um, Antonio, welcome to the Swell Suite. Well, good afternoon to you, Sarita and Tanisha. <laughs> it's great to be with you. I love your energy. It's just what the world needs at five o'clock on a Monday. <laughs> We and appreciate way, that. Congratulations on this, your, your book. Hey, thank you so much. Add me up. <laughs> Antonio is holding up my book, guys. <laughs> we're doing audio, but I've got some, uh, we're so used to Zoom and audio meetings. I've got some visual aids here, but this yeah. book, Find Me Up, which is a collection of puzzles and questions and games, and uh, it's fantastic. So congratulations on that because thank you. it's really hard take something from the start to the, you have an idea and then to take it from the conception to doing it and finishing it is really, really hard. So anyway, I love it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So before we get started with our conversation, please introduce yourself to everybody and tell them what you do. My name is Antonio Galoni. I own a company called Venice that publishes wine reviews and other articles. Um, you know, the goal with Venice is it's not just reviews, it's a lot of context. So this week, for example, we're going to publish two articles on Beaujolais and I'm reading these this final copy this afternoon. And there's a lot of history and how the wines are made and approaches and philosophy. 
philosophy. It's not just numbers and and short little tasting notes. It's the goal is to really to deliver really comprehensive uh, opinions on the world's you know great wines. So that's the core of what we do. And then we have other things that we do. We'll do occasional tastings when you can get together in public. We have a series of vineyard maps that we're doing in California. So there's a bunch of different things, but the core is publishing wine reviews. Very nice. I read, I did some reading about you and it said that you were introduced to wine quite early because of your family. Tell us like your initial introduction to wine. Well, you know, there are two sides of it. I think the, the one that's the most important to me was and my family is a very, comes from a very humble origins in Sicily and very agrarian jobs, you know, picking lemons and, you know, where the, the, if you have a son who's 10 years old, he starts to work because he's a, almost an adult. And, you know, my dad has a fourth grade education, you know, and that's it. And, but he's a successful entrepreneur two times over. But that's that culture that sort of post-World War II European culture where families were poor, kids worked. And my grandfather, he always had a glass of wine at lunch. It's not any of the stuff that's in your book or that I write about or that you guys were talking about, you know, in the intro. We're talking about bulk wines that you buy at a farm. You would take your jug and get it filled. And there was a time, this is hard to believe, but there was a time a few generations ago when people didn't trust bottled wines. They, didn't, they, they thought that they were full of chemical, you know, preservatives and, and chemicals and whatnot. And the only way to get a genuine wine was to go to a farm, like a real place where they made it and get your, your plastic jug filled. So that's what my grandfather would drink. He would drink, um, he would drink these, you know, this bulk wine that he bought somewhere and he would put a peach in it, half a peach in a cold, very cold white wine. And that's a reminder that, you know, today we drink wine for pleasure, just like you guys were talking about. And, uh, but there was a time when wine was cleaner than water to drink. And when people drank it for the nutritional value and the calories, just like spirits, you know, uh, it was really a uh, food basically. So that's the, my most endearing, my most important memory of wine is really the fact that it's at the table every day. It doesn't have to be expensive or prized or rare, even though, you know, we do get to taste a lot of those wines and, and, you know, it shouldn't be fussed over too much. You know, over the weekend, the tree saw that Becky Wasserman passed away. If you don't recognize the name Becky Wasserman, she was a Burgundy great, like a Burgundy queen, like the mother of Burgundy wine. She was a broker and she was a champion for small growers from around France. Um, she died recently at the age of 84 from a respiratory illness. She was instrumental in introducing small growers in Burgundy to the relevant importers to introduce those wines to the U.S. market. Collectively, the international wine community celebrates her influence and dedication. She'll be missed. One of the great things about her is that she viewed every wine as that sort of, she didn't say, well, it's moosing me, therefore I should exalt it more. And it's this humble appellation. And therefore I should think about it. She, she treated every wine as having its own dignity. And I think that's really important. So the first thing for me was that wine was at the table. It was a product of nature of a farm and it didn't have to be super rare, super expensive. The other side of my family also had similar sort of origins, very poor agrarian, you know, but, the, but my grandfather did pretty well. And so he had a corporate job and he got introduced to wines like the wines you guys were talking about at the beginning or like the wines that we write about. And so that was my first exposure, you know, to sort of Sunday lunch with a bottle of Burgundy or a bottle of Rhone wine or, uh, or an Italian wine. And so that was, so it was just, oh, it was always there. And what I, liked was looking at the labels. I liked looking at the labels and trying to understand what the words meant. And that was really my first real attraction to wine was seeing a label like I've got, you know, I know your listeners can't see that, but here's this wine that I tasted yesterday. And I would look at this label. I'd want to understand what every word meant. So that's really how it started. So yeah, I got introduced to it very young, but not, not with some sort of it's, there's no story of some sort of, you know, seller of really rare collectible old wines. It's really very, very humble. But, you know, even today, you know, we, you know, for example, today we published a review of a, a Chianti that I love. It's a 23 or $24 wine. It's absolutely delicious. And, you know, as much as I like tasting those more fancy wines, they're supposed to be great, you know, and there's just not much of a surprise when they're great because they're supposed to be great. Just like when you go to a restaurant, 
you know, if it's an elegant restaurant, it's supposed to be great. So there's kind of not a lot of suspense left, but it's the joy of finding that little hidden restaurant that's tucked in the wall, you know, a hole in the wall where you have a great meal or that bottle of wine that's inexpensive, that's absolutely delicious. That to me is actually more fun. So, you know, I try to always remember the, that because it's really important to stay grounded, I think. I mean, the way you speak <clears throat> about wine is truly artful. It's, 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 it seems like something that you love. Like when, because I, I also read that you're like a trained musician. So at what point did you realize that you wanted to spend most of your career uh, talking about wine or judging wine? You know, it just sort of happened over time. I mean, I, my parents, so then later on, when I was in high school, my parents had a wine shop. And I, I used to love hanging out there. But then I had just various different careers. I, you know, I was a very rebellious teenager. So of course, I wanted nothing to do with my parents. It's so ironic that I would end up in a field that's very close to what I grew up with. But as a teenager, I was super rebellious. So I, you know, my, my dad in particular was devastated when I told him I didn't want to run the family's company. You know, it was just, I wanted to do music. So I went to music school and I had jobs in finance and other things, but in my, in my spare time, especially I had a three year period where I was working for an American company and living in Italy. And on the weekends, I'd, I'd go to Piedmont because it's the, one of, it's the closest really great region to Milan, two, two and a half hours, you can be there. And I didn't have anything else to do. And I just, I just remember being in a winery, you know, where somebody gives you a glass and you're going to go down to taste from the barrel. So you're in this old, it wasn't a fancy winery, but it was just an old building with an old historic cellar, you know, so the steps are all irregular and you have to bend over, you're going to hit your head, you know, that kind of a set up, set up. And we were going down. So I remember exactly where I was. I remember going down to the, it was in Barbaresco, going down to, taste wines from the barrel. And at that moment, it sort of hit me like a, a really like a light, like a bolt of lightning, people would say, but I just knew like, this is what I want to do every day. Like, this is what makes me really, really happy. And I think if you can find that in life, you know, it's really quite liberating. And so I just, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. And then it just sort of happened from there. Is that where the Piedmont report started? <laughs> Yeah, and then so I had those three years where I lived in Italy and I had loved those wines all along. My, my dad loves them. And, but at the time, you know, they weren't really collectible at all. I mean, they were just, I mean, there were a few estates that were well known, but you know, these were not expensive. I mean, they're not inexpensive wines, but they were wines that you could afford to buy mm -hmm. and drink and that you could also that you could go into a store, buy a bottle, decide you liked it and go back and get more. That doesn't exist anymore. So I, and my parents sold them. So I was exposed to this, you know, from a really young age. And then I went to live in Italy for three years and I was there all the time tasting these wines. And then I came back to go to business school. I thought I was going to study finance, but I just really wanted to taste wine and write about it. And at the time there wasn't that many, there weren't that many sources for information on Italian wines. It was just really, there's the wine spectator, James Suckling always did a great job. So that was one publication. And then at the Wine Advocate, Robert Parker's publication, there was just occasional coverage, but not anything continual or very timely, but it was really high quality. It was just not timely. And I had just been there for three years, like literally, and I had all of this uh, information like inside my head. And so I just started to write it down really just for fun. It was really, I started to take notes on wines just for myself, just so I could remember, oh yeah, like two Fridays ago that, Pinot Noir that I really love, that was literary or, or, you know, whatever. And so, so I just started keeping track of wines for myself. And then when I came back to the States, I saw that there was this, what I thought was an opportunity, not a lot of people writing about Italian wine. And I had a lot of firsthand knowledge. And so I just started writing it for fun. And then it just turned into this publication and it just sort of happened on its own. But, you know, I just really think if you follow your passion, you know, you need a little bit of luck. Uh, let's be honest. I, I think you always need a, a little bit of luck in life. And I've had more than my fair share. But it was just, uh, I just started writing really out of passion for those wines. And then again, it turned into a publication. And then that was the beginning. So um, after the publication, that led to several other opportunities. And you, you kind of, you became a wine critic. Did you enjoy that at, at all? 
yeah, I mean, then, so that's what Piedmont Report was. It was my, my reviews of these wines with some other kinds of tastings, like vertical tastings and, and things like that. And it sounds sort of funny to say it now, it's like not even, it was about 20 years ago, but that stuff, stuff just didn't exist for Italian wines. I mean, you know, there were a few producers who were exalted, like the top Bordeaux or top Burgundy, but not, there wasn't really the, I also felt that Italian wine wasn't being written about with the same seriousness as other categories. And I thought that there was an opportunity to, to write about Italian wines the way people are used to reading about these famous, you know, Bordeaux and, and Burgundies and Rhone wines. And so, so Piedmont Report was this collection of reviews. And then I met Robert Parker. I was still a student and I was still in business school when I met, when I started talking to him. And he offered me a job right away. And the first time I said no, because I wanted to be on my own. But then, then life got, you know, getting married, having kids and stuff. It was just too much to, to do that and have a publication. And, and I had a full-time job in, in a, in a, in a, working for Deutsche Bank, a big German bank. So I couldn't I'll possibly do all of that. But Piedmont Report, yeah, it was, it was the beginning of writing reviews. And then that led to a job with Robert Parker. First, it was just Italian wines. Then, I, then champagne, and then, but when I was doing those regions, it was still, I mean, you know what it's like, you're juggling, you know, a full-time job and your passion and family, and it's just really, really hard after a while. So then in 2000, late 2010, 2011, I went to work full-time for, for Robert Parker, but in the beginning, it was just part-time articles. And, you know, the first time, the first time I got, uh, the Wine Advocate still back then was largely a print publication. And, and when I got the first, first of all, I couldn't believe he wanted to pay me to write reviews and my expenses. I'm like, I'm like, okay, great. And then when the, when the first one came in the mail and I looked at the Mind Advocate, which at the time was like the reference point for serious wines, it's sort of, you know, that, that, that manila colored paper and the black print with the capitals for all the wine names. It's a very unique kind of old fashioned style. When that thing arrived at my door, I thought I should be paying him <laughs> to have my reviews in this. Did you save your first copy? I'm sure I've got a few here somewhere, but yeah. it was like, you know, it was one of those, like, this is just absolutely insane because it happened so fast. It happened, you know, literally, literally, I mean, this is like, you know, being a walk on and then, you know, playing. Mm no title in a sports team or something i mean it just doesn't like happen if it's you know you just start writing and then all of a sudden you join this very elite publication and i mean it's very fast but i was just you know i think luck is important i also think you know being in the right place at the right time is a is what defines success for a lot of people and you it would be great if you could capture that in a, in a bottle and mm -hmm. reach it but it's just that thing that happens so hmm. i was lucky yeah so then i started writing for bob and i did that for about six or seven years and then decided to do my own my own publication but yeah it's been kind of an interesting path hmm. did uh, be working full-time and being a wine critic did it all change how you enjoyed wine well this is a great question uh, it does it does uh some ways it's good in some ways it's not so good in, in the sense that that you get to taste a ridiculous amount of really great wines. So whether that's going to a winery and having them open some older vintages, which gives you perspective, or the people that you meet, especially the, you know, there's, there's a, a, our readers happen to be people with incredible sellers. And one of the things about people with incredible sellers is they often don't have enough people to drink those wines with, the people who really appreciate that. So, so you get to meet these people. They're generally extremely generous and they, they enjoy opening their wines for people who appreciate them. So that leads to tasting all sorts of crazy, crazy, crazy wines. Uh, but then like I rarely open, I mean, I have more wine that I could ever drink, but I rarely open a, a bottle myself. You know, I, I usually I have those wines. I take them to people's houses when they invite me to things or for tastings that we do, but you know, on a, like a Saturday afternoon, you know, I, I have all these wines open. So I, I, I'll just 
if I'm gonna have a glass of something, I'll taste something that I that I have open. But you know, you do. I, I think like any profession that you know that you 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 get so focused that if it maybe some of you do, you do lose a little bit of the spontaneous pleasure of just opening up something. You know, I mean, it, you know, it's it's it, I think it's common of a lot of professions, right? They they always say that the 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 kid without the shoes is the cobbler's child, right? So there's something about when you get so focused in something, you kind of forget maybe some of the simpler pleasures. And some, I try to remind myself of like that to just, you know, go out to dinner and have cocktails or just go out to dinner and just order a really simple bottle of wine and don't, don't care what it's, how, you know, yeah. good or not good it might be technically. So yeah, you can lose a little bit of the pleasure of it, but you know, you have to sort of remind yourself why you started. For me though, I mean, this is the best job in the world because I got to taste all the wines of my favorite regions. But I'll tell you, if you didn't like it, I mean, I have in this house right now, probably 600 wines that I have to taste in the next couple of weeks. And wow. if, you, if you didn't like it, it would be the worst job in the world. <laughs> yeah. Because you're dealing with that, you know, you know, what publishing deadlines are like pretty intense. Yeah. You have the deadline, you have, you know, the, what your readers are asking you to do, which is our readers are have very high expectations of us, which is great. But I mean, you know, they're holding our feet to the fire. And so there's pressure. And if you had to taste all those wines and write something about them and you didn't love it, you would just, you would just get depressed. It's, it's a, so you have to really love it. You have to mm. really, if you do, then it's the greatest job in the world, but I wouldn't say it's necessarily for everyone. Gotcha. Tanisha, you think you could be a wine critic? I think so. And I was just, <laughs> now while he was talking, I was like, I think I can do this. But also, <laughs> if you didn't like it or you didn't love it, it would be difficult. It would yeah. be difficult it yeah you it's nothing you can power through like if you're a computer program like okay I don't really like it but okay let me write mm -hmm. and get it out of the way but yeah. as a wine critic and, and you know knowing that people are depending on you to write what you need to write and making sure you hit your deadlines and all the wines you have to taste yeah you gotta love it hmm. yeah. interesting uh oh, so all of us have judged wines before what's yeah. like something that you like to drink after you've been tasting wine all day? Something with the bubbles. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> it can be beer. Beer is one of my favorites. Sometimes champagne. But if, if it's really high acid, that can be a little bit disturbing. But something with bubbles and cold. Yeah. And I don't really, some people like to drink, you know, Parker really loved, you know, drinking like scotch and like, you know, like mm. one or two heavy duty drinks like that. But I, I just can't. Um, I can't fathom the idea of some sort of hard alcohol after drinking because, you know, if you're tasting, let's say you're in a competition or whatever, you taste 20 wines or 40 wines or 50 wines or 10 wines, whatever it is. But, you know, there's some amount of that obviously that's getting into your bloodstream yeah. anyway, no matter, no matter how diligent you are. So, so to then go out and like pound a, like a hard drink to me is a little much for me personally. But, you know, and other people can. But I, so I'd rather drink something that's cold, bubbly, and preferably not too alcoholic. And that's another reason why you have to really love the job. Because unlike, you know, Tanisha, Tanisha was mentioning computer programming. Uh, but, you know, tasting wine, I mean, it, it takes a physical toll on you. It's, it's, it's not like a, a job behind a computer in, in the sense that you can walk away from that. You're not really putting something into your body. If you decide... I'm going to taste a hundred Napa cabs today or a hundred, you know, whatever. Barolos. I mean, as I said, some of that does get into your body. And if you're not careful and you don't balance that with exercise and not partying and you try to balance your life, so you're compensating for that somehow, you know, it can really destroy you. And I think mm -hmm. that there's a lot of people in our business who end up having all sorts of health issues and, you know, who can't let it go. I think that, you know, also we know alcoholism is a disease. So that's something genetic. So it's not like your choice necessarily, but boy, if you're surrounded by all of these things, it's pretty hard to, you know, to resist the temptation. I mean, you've got a house full of, you know, the most exquisite wines in the world and it's fun to taste it, but then put it away. But some people just are un unable to do that. They're chemically mm -hmm. unable. And so that's why I think you've got to be really careful in this business because there's definitely some pitfalls. 
I'm glad you mentioned that as far as from a health standpoint. Um, I think people, a lot of times they think of it from the alcoholism and overindulging and things like that, but people don't really think about it from a health standpoint of just the fact that, okay, you're judging a competition or, you know, you have to critique say 50 wines in an afternoon um, and then 50 more wines the next day. Like that's a lot to take in. And from a health standpoint, if you're not drinking a whole lot of water in between, if you're not, you know, eating a couple crackers, if you leave there and then you want to go home and have an actual full glass of wine, like some people do, they're like, I've tasted all day. Now I want an actual glass that I can drink myself. Um, it, it, it does take a toll on your health. It takes a toll on you physically, a little bit mentally, you just get fatigued and people don't really understand that. They think like, oh my goodness, that's the best thing ever. I can't imagine have, being able to taste 50 wine. Oh, that sounds amazing. It's like, you don't realize we're not drinking these. We are literally putting it in our mouth and spitting them right back out. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and then, you know, there's a lot of entertainment that goes on with this industry too. You know, people invite you, maybe you do yep. taste those wines and then after that there's some sort of dinner or lunch and there's more wine and there's all sorts of you know rich food and you're and not spitting then no exactly you're not spitting, you're not spitting also, you, uh, and in certain parts of you know you, you know if you go to france i mean yeah every meal starts with foie gras and it's like great the first time you have it and then after that it's like, okay <laughs> you know, I don't yeah. know. so so i i just think yeah i mean i think you have to I don't think, well, you don't have to, but I know for me, what's important is trying to find a way to not indulge in that stuff too much because I think it does, it can cut into your longevity and to your quality of life. So, but these are pitfalls, you know? Yeah. I mean, lots of jobs have them, but that's this one. Yeah. I'm going to go with what he first said. Like, you have to find a, a balance, um, either mm -hmm. cut yourself off at a certain point or figure out how to balance it. Like, all right, you, you know, know you're going to drink a lot. Okay. So you work out harder or you mm -hmm. for drinking, you know, a lot of water or something like that, but yeah. it has to be a good balance, not overindulging in one and then also overindulging in the compensation part too. So you have to figure out the happy medium there. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I have this, um, I think I've created a new tradition. So after a wine trip or like days of tasting, I just want a big bowl of ramen and like, <laughs> this is more best. alcohol, but a, a big bowl of ramen and a gin and tonic. That's it. And then I probably won't drink for like the next week, but that's like a, to me, that's it's soothing. So I've got, I've got my bubbles and I've just got this nice savory bowl of soup. That's not, it's not too rich, but it's like just enough. Yeah. No. You do gin and tonic. I drink beer after, and I know <laughs> drink beer, but I yeah. want a cold beer because it's cold. Yeah, yeah. And you um, guzzle bill, right? I don't drink beer. That's what you're supposed to do, guzzle it, right? I mean, you can. Recording <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here, so I'm not gonna say. I do just talk about moderation and balance. <laughs> Okay, so the next set of questions are our closing questions. They're kind of fun, just getting to know you a little bit better, Antonio. So um, so each week we have this money question and we've been raising the money every week. So now okay. we're up to $25,000. Wow. So if you receive $25,000, what would you do with it? Well, I know what I'd like to do with it, but since I'm going to be responsible, I would say <laughs> college education. Oh, oh, very nice. Oh, you don't have to be responsible here. Like yeah. <laughs> this is a safe space. <laughs> right. We have been absolutely <laughs> irresponsible. I have cash. If I had if somebody said here's 25 grand, I'd be like, yeah, I can't really do I'm not I, the right the, the right thing to do right now. My kids are 11 and 15. It's like, yeah, uh, let's put yeah. Aside for, yeah. Okay. So, All okay. of it? You wouldn't have like a little fun money, like take them to Disney World with a little bit. Little five, oh, all right. What if you did 20? What if you put it like right. 20, put 20, 20 and away and spend that? <laughs> put 20 for the college and five <laughs> for Disney World. Okay. All right. okay. That's fair. That's fair. Okay. Yeah. All right. Tanisha, what's your answer? Uh, I think I'm doing the 20 and five thing too, but five, um, I think I'd redo my wardrobe. Ooh. Redo, do a full, you know, get a mm -hmm. stock. Do a wardrobe redo. Um, 
I want to do that. And uh, then I would, you know, do some cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, something with the <clears throat> money. I figure that out. Figure out this NFT situation. Um, exactly. Exactly. Get into that. Um, mine is is so. Um, me and my husband, we like to go to open houses in different areas in DC, and we went to the one this weekend that had a wine cellar with an office attached. And the, well, it was more like a closet because it was like the size of an office, but it didn't have windows or doors. So I was like, oh, my God, this all would be mine. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to go with um, a wine cellar um, with an off like an office or closet attached because that's perfect for podcasting when you don't have windows. So mm-hmm. that is my answer. It wasn't big, small wine cellar, just racks all around in the basement, dark, cool with a small oh, office mean. attached. That's it. That's what I would do. Because I don't even want a big cellar because yeah. I don't drink the things I have. So right. I don't want to have a cellar with, oh, look, it's 200 bottles. Like, mm-hmm. I don't want to drink 200 bottles. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So more than more than two, more than 20. But yeah. 200. Mm-hmm. Okay. Gotcha. All right. All right. Next question. On fresh bread, olive oil or fresh butter? <sighs> You're breaking my heart. <laughs> this is the hardest question anybody. Is it? Ever- I thought it would be easy for you. I thought you were just gonna choose olive oil because of Italy. I love, I love, love olive oil, but French butter. I mean, that, that's what I was about to say. <laughs> French salt and butter. Woo! I mean a baguette. You already know. Butter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean it's just. Yeah, I remember the first time I had that for breakfast in France, like with my parents a long time ago i was like this is like it this is it like, yeah that's an un, that's an unanswerable question this is a you know, understood this is a very heavy duty existential question <laughs> <laughs> with no answer i can't answer he's gonna it. be thinking about it all night he's gonna right. wake up in the middle of the night like, what, me, the hardest question I'm working out. <laughs> when i saw it i started to stress out I'm like, How am I yeah. gonna <laughs> like this the question that did it Okay. And he, and he, he looks stressed out, guys. He looks stressed out about this I question. Out. I'm, stressed, yeah. <laughs> I'm sweating. I'm sweating. I'm sweating. Okay, you don't have to choose. We won't make you. Tanisha, what about I, you? Oh, salted butter for sure. French salted butter. Yeah, and it's and it's and it's butter for me too because it's your fault. Because when I came to visit you, you took us to a place specifically for butter. for the butter. Yes, for the butter. I remember yeah. there was wine there, but you were like, no, no, no. No, it's about the you butter. this bread and this butter. Is yeah. What yeah. Yes. And so I totally get that. Mm-hmm. Okay. What's an Italian wine that people need to drink more of? Well, that's white or red? You choose. Uh, it's summer. Choose white. Well, I'll tell you. I think Suave. Mm, you know, I love Suave. Of- yeah, it's very misunderstood because it's mass produced and so a lot of people have this experience with these wines that are pretty watery and bland so rightly they've got a they've got a an impression of sort of you know industrial plunk but suave to me is an interesting wine because it's delicious when it's young obviously but it's one of those wines that will really surprise you with aging in a way that you would never expect I'm not saying it's a 30 year wine, like a great white burgundy or Riesling or anything like that, but you know, first of all, the wines are inexpensive. So you could buy three or six bottles, you know, drink one or two when they're young, put one or two away. And you know, when they start to have five, six, seven, eight years of age, you're gonna find, if you buy the good, the right names, you're gonna find really beautiful wines that have aged and have those complexities that we like in wines that are, you know, that are that have had a few years in the bottle where the the, the primary fruit maybe starts to soften and you get, especially in Salava, there's a lot of, these wines can have a lot of minerality and a lot of savory qualities. And so I think Suave is a, is a beautiful white wine um, because of that, com- it's a very rare combination of, of distinctiveness, the ability to age and value. And there's not a lot of wines where you can say, I'm getting all three. I'm getting a wine I can drink now getting a wine that I can age at least in the midterm. And by the way, I'm not breaking the bank here. I'm not killing my budget. So I vote for Suave today. Gotcha. Tanisha, do you have one? An Italian wine that I think people should know about. I think most of them. 
<laughs> um, that's fair. But I recently had, since we're talking whites, um, I think it was Fiano. Mm. And I really liked that. And I'm pretty sure I hadn't heard of it before. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the I think that's the beauty of Italian wine. Yeah. I'm drinking that's a pecorino. A yeah, I'm drinking yeah. a pecorino and it's it's wonderful. And like when I open the bottle and taste like, wow, why don't I drink more of this? It's crazy. It's wonderful. Yeah, Italy's I think it's one of those countries where there's just first of all, I think it's still the only country in the in Europe in which every region makes wine. Mm. And it's obviously, as I'm sure you know, extremely varied in its climate because you have the boot. So you're going from, from the north, which is very alpine, all the way to, you know, it's very, the construction of the country itself, you can just see visually that you, you would expect to see a lot of diversity because you have, you start with the Alps, these alpine regions, and then you go south. So you're, you're kind of traversing a lot of, of, of land. Uh, or a lot of lot of out of, uh, of of longitude as you as you, you know go down, and so you've got like all of these different areas, and it's just you know people will say two thousand indigenous varieties, three thousand I don't know a lot of a lot of variety, a lot of different places, white red um, wines that are made sort of more natural, low intervention wines that are more that are sleeker, everything in between. And to, yeah, I think Italy is just one of those countries you could spend your whole life, you know, researching it. Some people have, and you still feel like you're a student. That's a beautiful thing about wine. You know, you asked me before uh, how how I got into why I got into it, and why I think one of the things is that, you know, you're always going to be a student. Mm-hmm. There's always going to be something that you haven't had, a producer you don't know, a variety you don't know, a region that you don't know, a, a vintage that you haven't tasted. And it's one of those interests, you know, for people who are maybe thinking about getting into wine or who are sort of kind of interested in wine, it's one of those interests that you can nurture your entire life. Whereas some things, you know, maybe at a certain point in life, you get tired of it, or if it's sports and athletics, you know, at a certain age, you can't necessarily always do the things that you did when you were younger. It's, you know, something like wine is one of those things where you know, you have a lifetime of learning here. You have, you will always have something to learn and something to engage you. And so I think that that's one of the things about it that I find really fascinating and fun is we're all students. We're all in our little, our our own paths. There's always going to be a new door to open, something new to discover. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's just not, there's not that many pursuits that you could say that about. So it's really fun. Yeah. So this next question is for both of you. Uh, Tanisha, you studied Italian wines. You have your CSW and a wealth of other certs. Um, uh, What is the best way to study Italian wine? Oh, geez. Um, One, geography, like kind of knowing the regions and then knowing the grapes and then drinking them. I think geography has a lot to do with um, wine just in general, but if you know places and you can say, okay, well, these grapes are in the North and then these grapes are in the South, things like that, that will help you. And then just drink those after you get the geography of it down. Antonio, what do you think? Well, I'm a big believer in things that are practical. So, the best way to learn about Italian wine is, if you can, is to go, to go there. Go and spend, you know, you asked me what I would do if I had, you know, $25,000 and I said, well, 20 here, five there. You know, with, with just, with a fraction of $5,000, if you were careful, you could go spend a week in one of these regions and knock on a bunch of doors and taste and talk to people. And there, there's just, there's just nothing that can possibly substitute being in a place. Every, it's everything from eating the local food to hearing the gossip, to visiting the cellars, to tasting the wine, to talking to people, running into people you didn't expect to see. There's just nothing that can possibly replace the real experience of being in a place and understanding, oh, I, I now I understand because I see how long the day is in June in Northern Italy, or I understand 
the exposure of places because I can see the views or now I understand what altitude is because I've just gone to this vineyard that's really high up. You know, those things you can only do by, by being in a place. And it's, it's, you know, it's just sort of like music. I mean, the only way to really become a great musician is to play with other musicians. You can practice in your bedroom all you want, but that's not the same thing as being on the bandstand. That's where you really learn. And, and I've always been a big believer in it's, everybody's wired a little bit differently, but so, so, and everybody, and because of that, everybody responds differently to different sorts of inputs. So I can, I, I guess I'm only answering this question. I'm, and this is just my point of view for what I think is important, but somebody else could have an equally different view that's equally valid for them. But I think if you ask me, go spend a week in County Classico or Piedmont or Puglia or Veneto and absorb the culture. And that to me is priceless learning. And then the other stuff is equally important, but obviously you, you, can, you can read about and study and, and, and go through certification programs for really important, but you can do those at any time and anywhere. But you know, take, take a week and go to a place that's an unforgettable experience. And I honestly, you know, there's not enough of that. And I think it's a problem also for our industry. I mean, I remember having a discussion with them. This was a master sommelier, some like five or six years ago. And this person asked me who my favorite champagne, my favorite growers were in champagne. So my favorite artisan producers in champagne. And and I, I told them, you know, like two or three or whatever. And then, I, and then I asked him, you know, like, what are your favorite growers? And I was hoping to get a good tip or two because I was like, well, this guy's a master song. I mean, he must know like everything. You know? And he said he'd never been to Champagne. And I thought that was really odd. And I thought, well, why, you know, and then I started thinking, why is that? Well, the reason is that it's expensive to travel and not, there's not a lot of jobs that will give you the time or where you can make the money to do that. But I thought, you know, if I were ever going to do a certification program, I, I might make it all about being in places, you know, and because it's about walking the vineyards and seeing which vineyards are deep and which ones are shallow and feeling the gravel under your shoes and understanding, oh, that's gravel. It's a really well draining soil. Like that is really, really priceless. And I think for the industry, it's a challenge because there's not enough opportunities for people to have that kind of an education because it's expensive. So this is a long-winded answer of me saying, you know, that I just, I think there's no, there's no substitute for spending time in a place if you can do it. And if you can't do it, try to find a way to put it together, you know, uh, maybe go with some friends, see if you can share some expenses. Maybe it's not to Europe, maybe it's a trip to California, you know, Maybe you don't live far, maybe you live not too far away from a wine growing region in this country where you can do that. But just to go and taste in the cellars is so educational. And if you go and you bring a lot of passion to it, then people will respond in kind because you're, uh, you're sitting across the table from somebody who understands that you have a great deal of interest in their work. And so I just think that that is amazing if you can do that. No, that's a fantastic suggestion. It's a great answer. All right, only two more questions. All right, choose one or the other. Is Stanley Tucci searching for Italy? I don't know if you've seen it. Or Jada and Bobby Flay's, oh, their show in Italy. So two different shows. Have you watched them? And which one would we choose? Well, I haven't seen Jada and Bobby. I'm sure it's great. But the Stanley Tucci show is really fantastic. I, uh, I, I think it's, well, obviously he's a brilliant actor and performer. And obviously he brings a lot of knowledge to this subject. Uh, I think it's beautifully shot. If that doesn't get you excited about going somewhere, you're dead. <laughs> you're not a living person. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know the other show, but I think that that, that is a really beautiful show. And I, I like how it weaves together lots of different strands of culture and history and places. You know, the thing about that show 
and, and it's very similar to the Tony Bourdain show is if you had to boil it down to one thing, what is that show about? Mm -hmm. To me, it's about people. And, you know, we all have the same, everybody's got the same iPhone, the same Apple computer, whatever, the same kind of cars. But one of the things that's interesting, that's fascinating about wine is it's one of the few things that's made by nature. Every vintage is different. And these wines, the wines that we like are made by people. They're not made by corporations. So when I say, hey, find a way to go spend a week in California or weekend, whatever it is, or France or Italy, whatever it is. Yes, it's about the wine, but ultimately that, what that really means is about the people. And that show, the Stanley Tucci show, just like the Tony Bourdain show that was sort of, you know, a few years before, it's ultimately about these people that you meet that are so interesting and sort of understanding their history, how they've been on this farm for five generations or, you know, their parents had been done, you know, had done this, you know, two generations ago. And I think that ultimately it comes down to but the, the, the purest essence of, of that show, I'm sure that the Jada show is exactly the same and that it comes down to stories and people or the wines that we like to drink. It's ultimately about the people who make them. That's what it's all about. And, and that you can't get that except like by being there. And those sh that show in particular really makes you, I mean, I happen to, you know, I lived in Italy for a few years. So I've been to a lot of the places that they are in. And it's like, wow, they really capture the magic of, Milan, of Lake Garda, of Emilia Romagna. And, you know, it's been really cool. So, Yeah, I watched, I've actually never been to Italy, but after, and I watched it during the pand pandemic, of course, and I was like, oh gosh, yeah, I've got to go to Italy. And then it's, yeah. it's a show because I like to cook. It's a show that I can watch over and over again. And yeah. um, I like Stanley Tucci's voice. I love that the way he connects with the people because he's also Italian. So it's a, I think it's extremely well done. And it gave me hints of Anthony Bourdain in some sense. And I, yeah, yeah, I really connected with it. I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Tanisha, were you able to watch? No, nope, I haven't seen any of those shows. Yeah. No. All right. Last question. What's something that's Italian that should not be made in the U.S.? They shouldn't even try to make it because it's not going to be as good. <laughs> You're going to get me in trouble. <laughs> it's because there's quite a few things, actually. But, but I, I, I think He's like, my, oh. answer, my answer is coffee. You said coffee? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. There's a lot of things that are the reflection of, again, people, history, place that are really hard to, to replicate. And, and there's something about having a coffee in Italy that's really quite special. That's not to say that the coffee here in America is not great. It's, it's great. Of course, it's great. But there's something about an espresso in Italy that's great plus you know, the cherry on top. So... I, I say that just kiddingly. You know, these places, not just Italy, but it could be France, it could be Greece, it could be Spain, it could be California, it could be anywhere where things are from the land, from the, it could be the crabs in Chesapeake Bay. I mean, there's, there's something about things that are, there's a lot of, thankfully, right? As I said before, every, we've got all, we all have the same iPhone. It's wonderful when you can find something that's only made in one place or that is really made at a very high level in only one place because the whole world is standardized and you can get off a plane and have the same Starbucks Frappuccino like anywhere in the world if you really want. And some people want that or the same Shake Shack burger, you know, no problem. I mean, my kids love it. There's something about that that's okay. But, but to me, there's beauty in things that come only from one place. It's the wild ramps from this place. It's the morels from Oregon. It's the, you know, Maryland crabs. It's, you know, Maine blueberries. It's, uh, an espresso in Milan at the right shop, you know, the right bar. It's, and that those are unique experiences. And thank God that we have them because the whole, because, you know, I mean, the whole world knows like Amazon, I mean, you run out of something, you want to deliver it to your house tomorrow, you know? And that's, the whole world is about, is moved in this direction of standard, standardization and technology. So I, I like anything that is not that for whatever reason. And so there's something about when you have a coffee, you'll, when you go, 
You're going to send me a text. You're like, I had my first discussion. <laughs> You're right. You ruined coffee for me in America. <laughs> but no, I, so that's my answer. But I mean, I, I could be quite a few things, but that's the one that's like when you, when you get there, it's, yeah. Mm. When you have gotcha. a coffee in, in Milan, it's like, okay. Or Naples or Rome, it's like, okay, that's coffee. Yeah. Mm. That's Tanisha, what about week. you? You've been to Italy. I don't know as far as things that they just should absolutely not try to do. Cause I feel like they tried to do everything. Mm -hmm. And since my first experience with most of those things was the American version of it, it's hard to say like, okay, don't do this again. I understand. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Yeah. Sorry. I know that like I talked around, <laughs> but like, I'm really sitting here thinking like, what could it be that they just shouldn't do at all? Yeah, I mean, yeah, my answer is obviously a joke. You know. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I completely understand. But I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, America, they're going to try everything. Yeah. Whether they nail it or not is a different story. Yeah. No, they, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I've, I've never been to Italy, but um, my husband, he's crazy about clothes. So he knows Italian suits. So his answer would most likely be clothes, would be suits. Okay. Yeah. Well, fashion, you know, it's, it's, fashion is one of those things. I mean, people, they live it, they breathe it. This mm -hmm. stuff. I worked in an office in Milan for three years. So Italy is a culture where young people generally live with their parents until they get married. It's not like America where yeah. sort of like 18 or it's ready to go to college. And then maybe you live with some roommates and you know, you start sort of your life on your own kind of younger often, but, and people get married older. So it's not uncommon for people in their late twenties, early thirties to still be living with their parents. So in a city like Milan, you know, when I lived there, you, you know, the people that you're working with, they're all living with their parents and nobody's making a lot of money, but whatever money that people are making is disposable income because they're living with their parents. So people show up to offices, like they're dressed like, like they walked off a runway. Wow. <laughs> it's just, crazy like the average like just like sort of average office like the way people dress in Milan is like they all look like models I mean it's absolutely crazy so people they grow up with that the, the, that industry because the textile industry and also the design industry are so strong obviously it's part of people's culture you know uh, and so so people are used to these things and, and people pay attention to a level of detail that they just don't hear because it's not, I mean, obviously there's great fashion in America too, but the Italian style is, is really quite special. And it's not just the suit. I think what the Italians do better than any other country is people look great when they dress casual. Like mm -hmm. in America, casual is kind of like, I'm like, slumming it you know yeah but like the Italians have this way of like they're casual and they look so beautiful <laughs> so bad <laughs> yeah. crazy but they but fashion is one of those industries you know, there's two music and design and other things that are just part of the way people have been raised yeah and it's in their blood and so yeah i wouldn't i mean fashion is like my second or third answer because i would agree that something about it that's you know that there's just a level of attention to detail that's really pretty amazing and, and and again we're not talking necessarily about very high level expensive stuff I'm, I'm talking about the base level you walk into an office in Milan any office and the people who are like in their early 20s or like it's their first job let's say they all look like models <laughs> I'm not saying the executives, I'm not saying the CEO, I'm not saying the board of directors. I'm talking about you walk into an office, 20 year old kids, their first job, they all look unbelievable. Hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> With those, we'll wrap up our. <laughs> fashion is a really good answer for that question, yeah. actually. Yeah. Well, that wraps up our questions. Please tell everybody where they can follow you, where they can follow Venus, and anything else you want to share. Yeah, so Venice is Venice.com, B-I-N-O-U-S.com. Um, check it out. That's our website. You know, Instagram is very active for Venice. And then mine, at Antonio Galloni, my Instagram. 
and those that, those are our main our main outlets. Awesome. For who want to learn wine at all levels? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, this has been wonderful. Thank you yeah. so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Thank you, Antonio. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. What a great way to wrap up the afternoon. Absolutely. You brought a lot of cheer to this dreary, rainy Monday. This is like yeah. great. I feel fantastic. So thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Well, you have a good evening. Happy to do it. All right, guys. Talk to you soon. Cheers. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody. For- bye-bye. Thanks for joining yet another episode of The Swirl Suite, guys. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Antonio. Be sure to follow him on social media and follow Venice. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. We hope you have a great week. Cheers. Cheers.